Um, with no further ado, I'm going to launch into my intro and then hand it over to our favorites editor, Rachel Schechter. But I want to let you know, I am our CEO and publisher, Rachel Fishman Federson. I am so grateful that you are joining us today for our program, What Did Our Great Grandparents Used to Eat?, which is being hosted by the Yiddish Favorites. Um, please put in the chat where you're joining from. Rachel Schechter is our favorites editor. She's been with us for almost 25 years. We are, as you know, if you're here, you know, we are incredibly fortunate to have her. I'm really looking forward to today's program. She will, inter she will introduce our other panelists. But meanwhile, I'm gonna just get, tell you a couple of things. One, I wanna give a special thank you to our Abkahan Legacy Society members. The Abkahan Legacy Society is for those who pledged to remember the forward in their estate planning. And it's really integral to the longevity, the survival and thrival of the forward, Jewish journalism, secular Yiddish, and preserving our history. That support is really important and we're really grateful for it. And we're really grateful for all of you, for our readers, for joining us here today. The forward is a nonprofit. We have 501 C3 and we are supported by readers just like you. You are what makes our work possible. So if you enjoy today's program and you feel moved to give, that would be absolutely wonderful. We will send a follow-up email with a link to the recording and a link to give. And we encourage you to support the forward if you feel so moved. Um, now, just a tiny bit of housekeeping for the conversation. It's gonna be a great conversation. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A, not in the chat. The panelists, are paying attention to each other. They can read the questions in the, in the Q&A, but the chat just gets too long for them to follow where the question was asked. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. And again, we'll send an email after this event with a link to the recording so you can share it with friends, you can watch it again. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Rachel. Rachel, your turn. Shalom Aleichem. Welcome to our discussion on the question, what did our great grandparents eat for breakfast? An event supported by a generous grant in memory of Rabbi Max Tickton. So what inspired me to host a discussion on this topic? As many of you know, The Forward has a YouTube series called Yiddish Word of the Day. And every day I provide a two to three minute lesson on a certain topic. One day I produced one on breakfast and I thought that I would teach the Yiddish terms for what Jews in Eastern Europe ate for breakfast for many, many years and before the Holocaust. And I was basing it, I was born after the Holocaust in the United States. So I was basing it on what I saw other Eastern European born Jews who were born before the war, like my father and others, what they ate for breakfast. So the first one I said was dimaslinke, which means buttermilk. And then I also said bread and butter, bread and jam. So somebody commented, uh, somebody who I believe lives in Eastern Europe today, and said, there was no buttermilk in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, that's in the United States. In Eastern Europe, we had sour milk. And I did know that. Zoya milch, uh, you see it in Yiddish literature a lot. And I just assumed it was the same as buttermilk. So I started thinking, what did our great grandparents eat for breakfast? And I thought it would be fun to bring together uh, people of different persuasions who all have a fascination uh, and focus on Eastern European Jewish food. So I'm going to start with um, Eve Jocknowitz, whom you've seen co-hosting our Yiddish cooking shows. Uh, she was a fellow at the Frankel Institute of Advanced Jewish Studies at the University of Michigan and currently teaches Yiddish at the Yiva Institute and the Worker Circle. She worked as a cook and baker in New York and received her PhD on Jewish culinary ethnography in the Department of Performance Studies from NYU, New York University. She also translated and annotated a unique Yiddish vegetarian cookbook that was published in Vilna before the war, Fania Levando's Vegetarisch Dietetischer Kochbuch, and she adapted it for the modern kitchen. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet is University Professor Emerita of Performance Studies at New York University 
and Ronald S. Lauder, Chief Curator of the Core Exhibition at Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. Her books include They Called Me Mayor July, Painted, uh, Painted Memories of a Jewish Childhood in Poland Before the Holocaust with her father, Mayor Kirschenblatt. Her research interests include the history of East European Jewish food, and she owns one of the largest collections of Jewish cookbooks in private hands. Joe Bauer is a writer and filmmaker based in Berlin, whose work often focuses on Jewish foodways. He's also the host of the Yiddish Land podcast, exploring the evolution of Jewish cuisine. When he's not at his desk, you can find him running around on the trails. So I'd like to begin with you, Joe. Um, you actually did not grow up eating kasha uh, as a child um, or mamaliga as a child. You came to this as an adult. So can you tell us how this happened? Yeah, absolutely. And, and first, uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I, I get a little bit of the imposter syndrome sticking up because I, I listened to Ruffles get a short of the day. I've interviewed Eve myself as a writer several times to learn about this very topic. What did my great grandparents eat? Um, so I came to the topic because to try to make a long story short, because I know we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, I kind of was in maybe about five, six years ago, my wife was always doing all the cooking and I was doing the cleaning. We had like a nice little deal there, unspoken agreement. And I, one day I just kind of felt like the schlubby CBS sitcom husband with like the wife that he married up to get. And I was like, you know what? I should be, I should be doing my part. I should be cooking. And so she, she kind of got me into the kitchen. I'm chopping. I'm liking the chopping. I'm liking the whole knife work thing. And making like we make like Mexican burritos as kind of like a typical weekday thing. Um, and I really enjoy it. When we have something special, she's uh, Greek heritage and she'd make something Greek. So I kind of went into my family history and thought I'm kind of a bit of a mutt for lack of a better term, but the like actual dishes I remember eating as a child, I found out were Ashkenazi Jewish. And so that's, I was like, well, I'm gonna go down this rabbit hole and I have yet to come out of that rabbit hole. And you mentioned that something like uh, Mama Liga, we've been talking about Mama Liga. Uh, my great grandmother is from, or was from Romania. And I under, when I was doing my research, I understood that that was a dish associated with that region. So I, may, I, I like to find out about these things and kind of play with them and figure out how can I make it something that matches my taste for today. And that's kind of like the, the shortened spiel. That's very interesting, especially of uh, your generation. I think many yeah. of our readers, of our readers and viewers, um, think about that. You know, how can I get my children and my grandchildren into the cooking that I grew up with and that I love? And I think that you're an inspiration, truly. Um, Eve, um, I would actually like to hear. I mean, you have spent most of your adult life focused on the de Shikher, uh, the cuisine of pre-war Eastern European Jewry. So what do you imagine breakfast was like in a Ukrainian or Polish shtetl in, in the 18th century or 19th century? We have um, a lot of uh, memoirs and literary descriptions of breakfast. Uh, there are a lot of different things. I would start out by saying that the, uh, the, the most common food that I am encountering in all of the descriptions of breakfast in the old country is bread and butter. Bread and butter, I think, is what people really loved to have uh, when they started breakfast. And I would like to really begin with a beautiful story that Ruchel and I heard from one of the um, one of the extraordinary people who uh, contributed to our series, My Holy Mon Anelta, Timeless Delicacies. And that is uh, Fagel Gershonovich Biawovas. Uh, originally born in uh, Jawoshitze, uh, but grew up in Sosnovice. And she described uh, having uh, toast and butter with her father for breakfast. First, her, bra her father would get up in the morning. He would say the brachas. Uh, he would do his morning davening. And then he would toast some bread on a little portable Primus stove that they had. And then he would butter the bread for her. And 
when he buttered the bread for her, he made sure that he spread the butter all the way out to the edges of her bread so that every little bite of bread that she had was buttered. And the tenderness and love of this father buttering bread for a daughter is just absolutely unforgettable to me. Beautiful. And, Beautiful. and these are the people that we lost. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, for many of us, um, food does bring up the whole idea of mothers and fathers and warm family events. And, and we connected to that. And that helps develop the positive memories of those foods. So on the um, other hand, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to take up more. Um, no, uh, please. Well, on the other hand, there is a very, very familiar beloved scene in Yiddish literature of a very dysfunctional family having breakfast. And this is from the memoirs of I.J. Singer, uh, who was uh, the brother of Bashevis Esther Singer brother. Feitman and Bashevis Singer. And uh, he stayed for a while with his grandparents in Bilgarai. Uh, the title of the chapter in which he describes his grandparents' household is, My Grandfather the King and My Grandmother Who Questioned Authority. And his grandparents had somehow managed to have six children, but they had arranged their days so that their worlds were completely separate. And the way they did this is that his grandfather woke up at three in the morning or three in the middle of the night, really, and started studying Torah and drinking tea. And he he um, made an entire samovar of tea. And in the five hours from 3 a.m. to 8 a.m., he drank the entire samovar of tea. And uh, young Joshua's sleeping place was a daybed in his father's study. And he would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and observe. And he says, if legs sich oft aufhaben, in mitten schlop und zenim, sitzen beim Tisch, lernen dick und trinken dick. I would frequently wake up and see him sitting at the table, studying and drinking. Ich hab kein Mal nicht drinking tea, tea, not drinking yeah, uh, tea, alcohol. Tea, drinking tea. Well, we're getting to that. Uh, ich hab kein Mal nicht gekannt verstehen, wie Azoi der Yid hat gekannt a reinnehmen in sich, Azoi viel Tee und Teure. I could never understand how that guy could soak up so much tea and so much Torah. Uh, so this is his first breakfast. His grandfather's first breakfast is all this tea, but he's not eating anything yet because he hasn't prayed yet. And then at eight in the morning, yay, Barbara, hi. <laughs> and then at eight in the morning, he uh, goes to synagogue and there's a brief digression. It's the Ashkenazic synagogue, which is the poorer people, the less influential, uh, the Misnagdic, not the Hasidic synagogue. He comes, uh, oh, and his grandmother makes for him, for Joshua, tea with milk. But the milk is brown milk that has sat overnight in the oven, um, caramelizing. And so he gets this thick, sweet um, uh, dulce de leche with his So it's so tea. sweet that he doesn't have to put any honey into it? Yes, yes. And then finally, his grandfather comes home from shul and now it's about nine o'clock in the morning and then he has his second breakfast which is bread and butter and milk grits uh cereal cooked with milk and delicious coffee that his grandmother had freshly ground and then the last component of this second breakfast is after his grandmother has left from serving coffee and uh, second breakfast, his grandfather flips him a coin and he sneaks out to the monopole and buys his grandfather a flask of whiskey and his grandfather drinks the whiskey and then goes back to bed. So uh, he's up all night uh, studying, learning, drinking tea. Then when his wife wakes up, he goes back to sleep, and this is how they managed um, 
to the because, because you're saying because they had a bad marriage, this was the only way they could survive together. Was uh, this, this was the only? Yeah. But, but the meeting point is this delicious, all that tea and that delicious breakfast. Eve, I'm breakfast. so glad you brought that up because there's so much you can learn from reading Yiddish literature to see what people were living with day to day. In his this case, it was actually at least partly a memoir. Uh, he oh, did yeah. fiction as well. Uh, but whether it's fiction or memoirs, you learn so much about the folkways of the shtetl. And speaking well, of folkways, welcome to Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. We're so happy you came. Um, and to me, she'll always be Brindel. Um, so we're right now we're in the in the situation where we're trying to imagine, since the people, uh, our great grandparents are no longer with us, trying to imagine what breakfast was like. So Eve was reading us from Yud Yud Zinger. Uh, a chapter of uh, his memoirs. And I'd like to hear from your perspective, uh, having studied folkways and uh, Yiddish folkways and food for generations, <laughs> uh, how much you could share with us about what breakfast must have been like. Well, actually, uh, just one second. Um, yeah. Well, actually, uh, I have very little information. Eve, that's the most incredible source of information, a really extraordinary. The uh, Basically, what I know from my father is they didn't have coffee, they had chicory. And so, uh, tzikoria, so that, that they didn't have coffee. That was the first thing. Um, tea was probably most common rather than chicory. And the milk that Eve described was in a clay flask uh, with a with a kind of a brown glaze and my father would bring it to the baker's oven on Friday it would stay there overnight and they would pick it up in the morning for breakfast and it had it it, it was exactly as Eve has described it it was thick it was a beautiful brown color it was sweet and that was for Saturday morning breakfast but other than that I'd have to really sort of look more carefully at some of the interview, ter inter interview material, but it was not a noteworthy, let me put it this way, uh, on an everyday basis, it was definitely not a noteworthy meal. And it wasn't even a meal. It was maybe something that you grabbed, but it, it wasn't like you sort of sit down, all of you at the table, and you have something called breakfast. Uh, I don't even, I don't have any recollection uh, from my from my father about that. So I must say my contribution here is very limited. Well, I just imagine if a child is going off to Cheder, he's got to eat something. Children, I, I have grandchildren who stay over very frequently. At 6.30, they're screaming they're hungry. So what were the children given to eat? I mean, we don't know for sure, but we can certainly guess. One thing that we do need to keep in mind, I think that we mentioned this in a discussion that we all had, about the, it was seasonal. It really depended what the season was and what was available. And I think, I don't know uh, which one of you mentioned that, that um, actually something I didn't know that chickens don't always lay eggs in every season. Uh, and uh, so, you know, tell us a little bit about that, why we wouldn't have had eggs on certain uh, times of the year. Well, but not only I, that, but eggs would not have been a regular breakfast uh, item. You know, I think if there's going to be anything, it's going to be tea and bread, uh, basically, would be, um, I, I would imagine. But also, I know that uh, certainly cereal like millet um, and milk, uh, for example. But I just, you know, of all the things my father remembered, that was and he remembered a lot about food because I quizzed him just, you know, over and over and over again. But that was just not a big topic. I know, Eve, what about the eggs? Eggs for breakfast, I have not encountered, but uh, certainly eggs are an important, well, eggs for people who could get them. Uh, in Hirsch Abramovich's memoirs, uh, we read that eggs are a very rare delicacy uh, when you could finally get them. But on the other hand, in Fanny Lavando's cookbook, same city, same uh, decade, uh, eggs and butter in everything. Um, no, but she, keep in mind, but keep yeah. in mind that, that Abramovich, when he's writing, he's writing about Dorf Eden. He's, he's actually- Yes, yes, yeah. Village the difference. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, he's not he's not writing about Vilna. He's not in Vilna, right? <clears throat> well, I know my father often had radishes, um, fresh vegetables, oh, yeah. especially radishes for breakfast. He did have breakfast, and maybe this was under the influence of living in America, where everybody had breakfast. It was told it's an important part of the day. Um, so I think that. And radish, I never took a liking to radishes myself. I find it Love a radishes. very sharp, pungent taste that you really, it's an acquired taste, which I never acquired. Um, so I always associated radishes with Eastern Europe. But Eve, I mean, uh, uh, to Russell's question about when do hens lay eggs? Oh, hens lay eggs in the summer. Uh, and it's not the warmth that they react to, it's the daylight. Uh, mm. And that is why in contemporary um, sure. industrial uh, chicken, I, I don't know if I should use the word farms, chicken places, uh, they keep the lights on 24 hours so that the hens will just uh, wow. keep making eggs. Um, I also heard from people who came from the former Soviet Union, they would have kasha in the morning with milk which I had never heard of. I knew about kasha varnishkis, which you had with, you know, sauteed onions and mushrooms and salt and pepper. Um, did but you probably, ever hear about having kasha with milk for breakfast or for lunch for that matter? The word kasha can mean more than just buckwheat kasha. The word kasha also could mean any kind of uh, hot well, she meant She meant buckwheat groats because meant, I saw uh, her make it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you had heard of it. Well, no, I, I, Eve, uh, Eve was just saying that it could be, I mean, the, I only know it, uh, I, my my mother's cousin, Mariam, I remember that she used to like to cook millet and then eat it with milk. So essentially a millet porridge, um, but, and then Huber grits, so, so oat, um, oat, oat, an, an oat porridge as well. But Eve, I mean, oh, uh, what about other, other kashas basically? Um, I, uh, definitely uh, farina, cream of farina, wheat, right. um, uh, manakasha, many, many different gradations. Manakasha is manakasha. farina, right? Isn't manakasha, manakasha is farina. farina? It is, it is. The, the, there are a lot of different words in Yiddish for the uh, finer and the coarser farinas. And um, what's it? But, but also, if I may say that semolina and farina are not the same thing. And semolina, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing, but that's another whole conversation no well, coming I from, think, I think coming from romanian roots we did have mamalika a lot uh and we had it uh with sour cream and cottage cheese and it was very tasty whether we had it for breakfast or for lunch uh and it was um something that none of my friends had and had no idea and i said ruffle what are you eating um and it was just that's when i realized oh i guess this isn't an american food um, because my, my family was very, even though my mother was American born, she was very much in immigrant mode, uh, and cooked what her, what she had learned at home. So Joe, I know that you have been, um, playing around with Mama Liga on your own trying, you know, because part of this program is also not only what did our great grandparents do, but how have they trans, how have we been able to integrate it into our own lives in a way that we can enjoy it and share it with our friends. So, um, Joe, if you can share what you do with your mama Liga, that would be uh, very interesting for us. Sure. Well, um, I'll also ask you to mention porridge. Uh, it's not my great grandmother, but I did find an old handwritten recipe from my grandmother for rice porridge. Uh, I have no idea when she ate that, what time of day she ate that, but, um, but that didn't that that kind of led me down to Mamaliga eventually because I started looking into these kinds of similar dishes. Um, and then when I found out about Mamaliga, I know it's traditionally a very uh, savory dish. You might find it with um, with some kind of uh, a brinna, I believe is how you pronounce it, the kind of cheese that would go into it. Is that brinza? Brinza. Brinza, yeah. brinza right. Um, and but knowing that it. It, it, also having I, I did my little heritage trip to Siget and I saw they they eat mamaliga there all the time it, it's next to everything and where breakfast. in Romania yes yes, yes where did Norm you go where did you go Siget Siget yeah yeah and um and uh Cluj Napoca up there mostly in the north and then down to to Bucharest and really you can find it at any time of the day um but think of it as a breakfast food um and this is this might sound 
a little, very much to my own personal taste, I put it that way. When I was growing up, I was very much a child of all these like American mascot breakfast cereals. And I love the combination of apple and cinnamon. And for better or worse, uh, I was an Apple Jacks kid. I wouldn't eat this stuff today, just to put it out there, but I, I really love these kinds of breakfast cereals. So I just kind of, I, you know, I had, I had, a, I had some uh, cornmeal and I just, I wanted to figure out, you know, can I, what happens if I chop up some apples with some cinnamon in it? Is it going to taste any good? And, and it, my wife liked it. That's basically like 90% of why I make what I make. Um, and I really liked it as well. So that's basically what I like to do is kind of try to hear a little bit, especially like from folks like Barbara and Eve, you know, really understand better the history behind certain dishes, um, why they ate what they did, why they didn't eat what they couldn't have access to, um, and figure out how I can incorporate that into, into what I make uh, on a daily basis or once in a while. And especially the stories, like even the bread and butter, um, I'll never look at bread and butter the same way again. Like that makes a dish that seems so, you know, maybe boring on paper, oh, just infinitely more interesting to me. And speaking of bread, I see there are several questions about bread. Um, Ilana Hernandez asks, what types of bread would have been most common, bearing in mind regional variations? So I would have thought Schwarzbrot, which literally means black bread. But what exactly was Schwarzbrot? Was it pumpernickel? Was it dark rye bread? Anybody know? Pumpernickel is rye bread. Pumpernickel is rye bread? Because here in America, you go to the bakery, you ask either for pumpernickel, which is very dark, or yeah, rye. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's bread made with rye flour that has things in it to make it dark. Uh, like molasses? Sugar. Uh, you, um, you cook the sugar in water uh, until it's so burnt that it's not sweet anymore. And that's the color that you use in oh, the pumpernickel bread. And do they have starters? Or, because they taste a little sour. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other kinds of breads that you know? Oh, there. I think there are many. There are many kinds. Uh, my 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 father uh, right. called a very dense whole grain bread. So you know, when we say rye bread, we usually mean very very light, a very very light rye, which means it's mainly white flour with some rye added. But it's um, and we say pumpernickel if you get basically a soft bread that's black. It's black in color, but actually it's also um, uh, not like 100% uh, uh, rye and not a whole, it's not, a, let's put it this way, it's not a whole grain bread. The whole grain breads are like another, they're, they're not, so they're, they're in another league, but he mentioned a variety of them. And if you're in Eastern Europe today, if you're in, you know, uh, Poland, Ukraine, uh, Russia, the range of breads is just, and I mean traditional breads, not just you know, ones that are innovative, is just huge. And nazakfasha um, are specifically the sourdough ones. And you know, the degree to which they're whole grain, but the our, you know, the pumpernickel bagel, which is essentially a, a largely white flour that's made black, you know, it's it's not coming whether you you use like a toasted grains like postum or um, you know, whatever it is to make it black, but that's, I don't think of that really as a East European bread. In fact, when my husband is from Poland, he was born after the war, but he said when he first came here and he tasted bread from the supermarket, he said, this isn't bread. This is a sponge. Bread is supposed to have a crust, a harsh, hard crust that Absolutely. you can sink your teeth into. Absolutely. And my father, you know, would say the same thing. Absolutely the same thing. Um, so I don't know, Eve. You any thoughts on on bread? Um, um, I think uh, certainly in Poland, the uh, the typical bread on the table would be one of the rye breads or a bread, you know, with rye and wheat in it, and uh, challah um, on Shabbos, and then ufgefrischte challah on Sunday, the uh, French it's toast challah. Yeah. or fried challah and um uh, maybe maybe buckwheat bread sometimes mm. yeah there is actually a buckwheat bread that you make with green buckwheat and that you just basically soak the grains and uh, mm. overnight and then you know bake it straight with just you don't it's not a flour you actually make it uh -huh, with, the, uh -huh. with the whole grain 
So uh, you ground it, you grind it after it's soaked or before? No, you don't even grind it. You don't grind it. Wow. It's like those German um, rye breads the, the, with all the whole exactly. grains sort of right. pressed together. Well, you have another question have, from Joel Haber oh. uh, about butter, which is related to bread. Would the butter have been from cow's milk or goat milk or sheep milk? Anybody Mostly cows, uh, goat and sheep milk. You can make goat butter, but the milk isn't as rich. There's not as high a percentage of fat. So you would get just a tiny little bit of butter from a whole lot of goat or sheep milk. And mil and cows are also larger. Could that explain why it would be? Uh... There's also higher yield, yeah. I want to just answer one other thing, um, if I may, before we uh, continue about you know, breakfast in general, and certainly it was the rule, not a big deal in Eastern Europe, but there are occasional exceptions. And I have this one wonderful passage, which is from Esther Singer Kreitman, who is the sister of Israel Joshua Singer. I did not set out planning to only bring citations from this one family, but this is so good. And this is an exception to the rule. This is an outstanding breakfast. And, um, but it's, it's an outstanding breakfast in the context of your the, the, the little girl is waiting and waiting and her grandmother, who is a woman, attends services every weekday, not common or expected of women, and nobody gets to eat until she comes back from davening. But then you get a breakfast, an onbison is the word they use, kiyad hamelech, fit for the king. Smetna mit yagdis, cream with blueberries. No, Yagdis is bilberries. Okay. Uh, bil right, right. What the, um, the sourer and harder blueberries. And wild. Gekochte uh, Schwammen in Futter, mushrooms cooked in butter. Und frische Bagelech mit Putter and Käse, fresh bagels with butter and cheese, and the really delicious coffee. Um, so that. Ah, oh, it's such a wonderful breakfast with the seasonal fruit and the the wild gathered berries and the wild gathered mushrooms and the coffee. The coffee comes up in all three siblings. They all really love that fresh coffee for breakfast, which wasn't common. It was a special treat. But but as we heard, breakfast was not by uh, eaten by everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that these, most of them, uh, the vast majority of them were observant Jews. Uh, you can't eat bread until you make a mozi. You can't make a mozi until you said your Shema Yisrael prayer. And usually people didn't do, eat anything, especially the fathers didn't eat anything until the davening was over. So that's something else to think about that by the time the davening was over, you had to get to work. <laughs> so the first that he may be eating, because one of our um, viewers had just asked, I, I don't remember who it was, can we go out of breakfast already and let's talk about the other food they had on a Wednesday? So uh, just letting her know, we are already out of breakfast because uh, they did not all eat breakfast. These foods we're talking about were foods that, were, that could have been eaten any time of the day. Yeah, just but wanted. also we should add, that I think someone made a comment in the chat that there's a class issue, there's an urban rural issue. So clearly these fancy breakfasts are- uh, But this breakfast is mostly foraged food. Right, well, that's also very interesting. Also, I have to make a correction. That is the soaked green buckwheat groats. After you soak them, you do grind them, but you don't, you grind like in a food processor kind of grinding. You, you don't put them through a meat grinder or through a, a, a mill of any, anything, but you do. Right, but they didn't have a food processor. So yeah, how did no, they do they, it then? They, but they might, I don't know what they would have done. Uh, well, actually, I'm not even sure that they, that, that in Eastern Europe, the, uh, the buckwheat bread was made this way. I'm only, well, maybe, because I know I have a colleague in Poland that makes it. I would have to look to see what it's, what the tradition is for it and how the soaked groats would have been processed. But it's, so a, it's a, a, yeah, we yeah. have a question from Phil Hull, who says, um, was the tea black tea or would it have been an herbal tea? Black. 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 That's what I thought. Oh, and I'm seeing some questions about cornbread and rye bread, a source of com confusion in the bakeries in English speaking countries such as America is that the Yiddish word for the grain rye is corn. Corn. And maize, uh, as it is called in other speaking, other English speaking countries is called corn here. 
And so some places called rye bread cornbread. Uh, somebody, corn Karishnik, sorry, Karishnapper asks, what about herring? You forgot to talk about herring. That was obviously something that the men would have had in shul after the davening. Uh, had, uh, Joe, have you had any experience with, uh, there, I mean, there's so many different var variations of herring today in, in the United States. Do you have a, a liking to that? Uh, I have, I mean, that would make sense to me because one thing, um, you know, one of one of the sources I've gone to a lot, uh, besides Eve, I mentioned I've interviewed her a few times, um, was is, is Andres Kerner. Um, he writes a lot about um, pre-Holocaust life in the former Hungarian empire. And something he really um, keyed me into that I wasn't super aware of, it seems obvious now, but I wasn't super aware of when I was first writing about this stuff was that a lot of the things, most he, he focuses more, I believe on secular Jews and a lot of the stuff that, you know, Jews in Budapest were eating was a lot of the same stuff that non-Jews were eating. Um, and so now living in Germany and, and Berlin, uh, I could absolutely see how that could be the case because herring is it's everywhere, especially when you're uh, along the Baltic coast up here, um, throw it on a little brooch in. Um, people love that stuff around here. So um, it hasn't become a part of my regular diet, but I can definitely see, you know, the the historic roots in that in, in herring around here. Hmm. And Eve, uh, uh, Eve, did you ever do anything with herring? I mean, I don't think we ever made a herring episode, but did you ever do it? I have never personally, uh, I think I once tasted herring. I once tasted, um, but uh, I have a memory of uh, one time, uh, one time my mother- Eve is a dippers. vegetarian, so I'm making her very uncomfortable now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just remembering the smell of frying kippers. You could run, but you couldn't hide. I wrapped my head in blankets and towels. There was, uh, people love them. Uh, okay, yeah. so, no, okay, about herring. Kept our people alive. Okay, okay Brian, okay. tell okay, us about so, so, Okay, so first of all, um, you know, again, updating my comment about bread made from soaked green buckwheat growths. Um, yes, you could use a hand mill for you know for grinding them obviously uh, and and they are and it is you leave it 24 hours and it ferments so it's a very interesting it's actually a really really interesting bread now herring so herring if for my father's recollection was for dinner yeah, in other words it's a poor family or not so poor family's dinner and he has a very vivid recollection that his mother would send him to buy a herring and the uh, and he would bring it home, and it would uh, they wouldn't wrap it in anything because newspaper was very precious, and you know there there may be a couple of families would get together and they would subscribe to one newspaper, and then they would all read it, and you couldn't read it while you were eating. God forbid you made a grease stain on it because this was for my father when he came to Canada and he could afford to have his own newspaper, he could actually read it while eating. This for him was a great luxury. So what did they do instead? They would cut a small piece of paper, just enough to wrap around the belly of the herring so that he could hold it. Mm -hmm. And then he would literally hold it like this with the brine dripping as he walked home. And, wow. and he said he would lick the brine. He would, he would put his finger, his hand under the brine and he would lick the brine. Now, he was told that the best herring to buy is a male herring and he would bring it home and his mother would make what they called a, a, a katzborscht or a scratch borscht. What was it? She'd open up the herring, she'd pull out the sperm sac. She'd open the sperm sac, she would scrape out, that's where the cuts comes from. She would scrape out the sperm. She would mix it with a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of sugar, it was already salty. And that would be the sauce. Then she'd cut up the herring in pieces. She'd take a bread, uh, a rye bread, she would cut it up in pieces. The family would sit around, they would take a little piece of the bread, they would dip it in the katzbosht, and then they would eat it with a piece of herring. And he said in that way, one herring was a meal for the whole family. That was dinner, that was not breakfast. Right, right, right. And that is that roe? Is that what we call roe? Uh, or... No, 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 no. The female. Is female is a female herring, it's the eggs. Of course. It's the so... eggs, but this is the sperm. 
So this is the milt. Right. All right, another question from our audience. Uh, Julie asks, she says, this reminds me of my dad eating sour cream with fruit. We'd never eat that as is today. I'd completely forgotten about that. No, so today I we sour cream was yogurt. very big in my home. Yeah, we, no, we, you know, and my mother would make what she called a blotter. So blotter a, means mud. Which means mud. And a blotter was, and it was very delicious, was sour cream because sour cream is like the Jewish creme fraiche. You know, right. you know, you wouldn't say I wouldn't use creme fraiche today, but like all of a sudden you wouldn't use sour cream today. Sour cream is essentially the Jewish creme fraiche right. and, and, you know, Greek yogurt and whole milk yogurt and, you know, this ho whole range of soured sour dairy products and anyway was a blotta it would it would be for her it was chopped cucumber chopped radish chopped scallions i can't remember i don't think she put in parsley but i think those were the and that mixed with sour cream mm -hmm. um and usually it could be with or without uh cottage cheese uh but but even just straight uh with sour cream there is nothing more glorious than sour cream and and berries I mean, if you haven't tried, when I make it when I make an old fashioned potato soup. I don't use heavy cream, a uh, cream of potato soup. I use sour cream. It gives sour it a, cream, a real tang that I love. It's Joe, beautiful. are you into sour cream at all? Yeah, now that you're saying that, I'm like, oh, wow, my grand, that was definitely a go to ingredient uh, for my grandmother and in cottage cheese as well. Um, so I definitely remember that, but I never put the, the, the connection together. So I'm learning things too today. Yeah, so am I. I and also, I grew up on noodles, on egg noodles cooked and then uh, with fried onions and cottage cheese and salt and pepper. And then when I went, I went to a Yiddish socialist summer camp called Camp Hemshech. Uh, and so a lot of the foods were familiar to me, but, but I was surprised when they brought out the broad, the cooked egg noodles, they put sugar and cinnamon on it. I thought, oh, I can't eat that. Uh, yeah. So I asked the kitchen to bring out some, uh, I, I couldn't have the fried onions, but at least I had the uh, sour cream and cottage cheese. But also, you know, you don't see it around much, but I remember even from um, when I was living in the in the Jewish market in Toronto, where there's a Jewish dairy. And what I remember is farmer's cheese. And it was like in the corner of a pillowcase that they would squeeze out the liquid and it would come out in the shape of a heart. And wow. farmer's cheese is really... It's a, I, you know, I, you don't see it in the supermarket. I don't see it at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. Really? You don't have farmer cheese? We no. have it here in Riverdale. Oh well, yeah, you can get it. See it. Yeah, What's the I'm famous brand? It's a famous brand. It's like a stick. What is it called? Friendship. Friendship. Chip. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I see cottage cheese, but I don't, I mean, I'll have to look. I'll have to uh, look and see, but it's much drier Riverdale. and it's a different cheese. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, what was the Yiddish? What word, Barbara? What word did your parents use for breakfast? Uh, what was it, what Yiddish word? Frischtig. Frischtig. And and by you also, uh, by the all by all the singer siblings, it's on bison. Never. And another on never. Uh huh. And another word I've come across is Iber bison, and um, I have to throw in some lexicography for Rachel. And the uh, another word is pas shachris. Or breakfast, wow. breakfast pretty much became a Yiddish word. And then there is a portmanteau that may have existed only in my family, which was breakfast, of breakfast and fressen, to eat voraciously. And I also yeah. heard breakfast. Ah, <laughs> For breakfast, they call it breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to the radishes, I have one more uh, quote, which is from Bashevis. Uh, I, I will... And this is exactly the components of Barbara's mother's blotte, except instead of mixed with the sour cream, it is on a flamfletzel. And this is from the magician of Lublin. In der Zeit, when Yasha hat sich geparet in Heut, is Esther aufgestanden und zugegreit unbeißen. A flamfletzel mit Putter und Zwarech, junge Zibbele, Oh, Can you translate it now? I'll translate Eve, the whole Eve, thing. Yes. Eve, please translate. Yes. Uh, while Yasha was busy in the courtyard, Esther got up and made breakfast. A griddle flatbread with farmer cheese, spring onions, uh, radishes, or what she calls Rosh Chodesh radishes, little red or purple or pink radishes, 
uh, a sweet cucumber and coffee that she had ground herself in the coffee milk in the coffee mill and seethed in milk. Nice. You know, anybody who says that East European Jewish food is all either white or brown. Yes. And boring and deadly and, you know, like a heart killer and has no variety and they didn't have fresh fruit and vegetables and they were limited to eating, I don't know, potatoes and God knows what. Honestly, what can I say? Yeah. I want to, I want to bring up a question by uh, our good friend, Michael Alpert, uh, the, the Klezmer musician star. Uh, and he writes in Boston and elsewhere, they put a bit of cornmeal on the crust of what's called cornbread a white rye bread otherwise, as you say. As you may know, rye with caraway seeds is called a sisal bread in Boston and New England. I did not know that. So thank you, Michael. Meshka. Uh, and um, Barbara Berman writes, my father from Russia and Poland said that they never ate corn because it was for the animals. And my husband Label said the same thing. I too remember the smell of the kippers. Ugh, he often said he never met a herring he didn't like. <laughs> but you know, with corn, the sweet corn we have is nothing like the corn that they feed animals. So the corn that we have has been bred to make it so juicy and sweet, sweet, moist, right. et cetera. The feed corn is hard and starchy and is not for human consumption. I mean, it could be used, obviously, um, it can be dried and made into cornmeal and whatever, but there's a huge, huge difference between the corn that's fed to animals and the corn that we, that we would eat. That's right. That's right. Ava Weisler oh. asks, were there any hard cheeses? Because so far we've been talking about soft ones. Anybody know? Well, my father described a cheese that they would buy at the market from farmers and it had to have been naturally soured. I don't think it was made with rennet, but uh, however, and what he said was that it would be wrapped, I think probably like in a cloth that had been soaked in vinegar. And then it was put on top of the, um, uh, in a warm place, like sort of like not a warm, warm place, but that it would dry out and become hard and that mm -hmm. they would have it through the winter. So it didn't start out that way, but that, that, that was the only hard cheese I ever remember him mentioning. And they could keep it cool just by leaving it outside because it was so cold out, they didn't need refrigeration, which they didn't have anyway. Eve, what about you on, on cheese? Um, I uh, A lot of times, uh, if you're talking about written sources, they refer to cheese. Sometimes it's clearly a fresh cheese. Occasionally it might be a hard cheese, but um, Rarely. I don't know. I don't know of anything specifically referring to a hard cheese, well, but for long you. journeys. Thank you, all of you. We're actually out of time. It is oh, no. <laughs> it's one o'clock. Uh, this has been so interesting for me. Oh, the Such a learning poem? experience. What? There's a poem about breakfast by Malka Heifetz Tuzman. Should we finish with that? Let's finish with that in Yiddish and then in English. Okay. Beim runden Tisch, sie und kegen im. Stay Gleselech Maranzenza, Far im, Far ir, Erasup, Ziazup, Beiten sich mit die Gläser, Trinken, Trinken, bisend Narop, A Penitzel zugebräunte Bräut, Erze halbt, Pamelichke, von Hand seine sie nimmt, Pavolinke, die Finger ihre klingen on in seine. Kessen Marmeladen nach dem Tisch sich winken über. Mit Eugen a bissele Farschmurit sie ziehen tief in sich herein am Rad von Heselkappe. Pantoffel ihre unter Tisch spielen sich mit seine. That's beautiful. This is Malka Fay Fitz Tuzman. Yes. So she, yeah, so she's a poet. I believe she lived in California, right? Uh, uh, born in uh, the old country and then a girlhood in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and then California. Okay, good. So now please so Milwaukee, translate. It's a, lovely, yes. a lovely love scene. At a round table, she opposite him, two little glasses of orange juice, 
for him, for her, this is already in America, a sip for him, a sip for her, they swap glasses and drink, drink till the very bottom. A slice of toasted bread, he cuts it in half. Slow, slowly, and it's like slowly, but with a diminutive, because you can put diminutives on adverbs in Yiddish, in a cute, slow way, uh, from his hand, in another slow way, her fingers touch his, cheeses and marmalades wink at one another across the table. With their eyes still a little closed, they draw into themselves the fragrance of hot coffee. Her slippers touch his under the table. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Eve, Barbara, and Joe. Thank you all for joining us. And if uh, I can ask Ruchel, if someone on your end can save the chat. Yes, we always save the chat and we will, we will send it to you. Yeah, and so you. as we say in Yiddish, Zeit gesund. Come on.